So I wanted to talk about how I learned how the fundamentals of computers sort of fit together, how computers work, really. Um, there's a sort of a mental model that I picked up in the 80s that has stuck with me for now 40 odd years. And even now when I sit down and try and solve computer problems, especially performance and sort of very sort of techy things, I still kind of mentally picture the things that I picked up from a book in 1985-ish. That book was an Usborn computer book for the Z80 and the 6502, which were the two main CPUs in the computers of the day. If you'd had a Spectrum or a BBC Micro or Commodore 64 or an Apple II, then those were the CPUs you had. They were little 8-bit CPUs, very simple. But the really cool thing about those is that the stuff that you learn to program an 8-bit controller works today when I'm sitting down with a 64-bit whiz-bang server in a data center, right? That's the same thing under the hood. Nothing has changed that much since then. And so what I would like to do is kind of explain how a computer program works from that very basic uh, point of view, each of the individual steps that it does, and uh, more importantly, sort of introduce you to the concepts that I still picture when I'm thinking about how computers work. And this scales from this really simple explanation all the way up to the most um, recent developments in branch prediction and caches and out of order execution that modern computers do. So it's great, but we'll start with really simple things. The book by Osborne, they've made the PDFs available so you too can download. They sort of like totally anthropomorphize the computer and they sort of explain the computer in terms of a set of robots that live inside the computer and they have things that they can do and uh, somehow the operation of these robots caused interesting things to happen in the outside world. I will point this down at a piece of paper, give you difficulty editing. So. These robots that live inside the computer, right? So here's my little robot. I have sort of extended what the Osborne books described for my own sort of purposes here. So for this video, this robot is a, got very simple things. He's got a little abacus and he can do very simple sums on the abacus. And that's my attempt at drawing an abacus. And he's got a single piece of paper which he can write one number on. So this is gonna have the number 10 on, say. When he's told to do something, he can use the abacus along with another number and he can add or subtract from that number and then he will update that number. And there's only literally one number that can live on this piece of paper. So if we added 10 to this, his piece of paper would now have 20 on it. And so this is where he's gonna kind of store the one and only thing he can work on at a time. And we call this the accumulator because we're accumulating the results of what the little robot's doing in this piece of paper. Now. There's not much you can do with one piece of paper, as I'm sure you can appreciate. So the robot can also go to the RAM. So the robot in this instance represents the CPU of the computer. And then the RAM, which is the memory of the computer, is represented in my mental model. There we are, we're gonna draw it as a set of pigeonholes. So it's a huge, huge array of pigeonholes. And each of these pigeonholes is labeled. So we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever. So thousands and thousands and thousands. Now, I say thousands and thousands. It was thousands and thousands in 1984. You know, your Spectrum had 48,000 of them and the BBC Micro had 32,000 of them. Or if you were posh and had the, the extended ones, 128,000 of them. Modern computers have billions upon billions of them. So this is the RAM. So the megabytes and the gigabytes of your memory are these little pigeonholes. But it's much easier to think about them as pigeonholes than anything else. And so what we can put into each of these pigeonholes is one of these pieces of paper with a number on it. So each of these pigeonholes can have a little piece of paper with a number written on it. And the robot can do two things with this. He can take his piece of paper to a cell and write, copy the number down. So he can take number 20 and he can write it up in here, number 20 in cell zero and pigeonhole zero. Or he can go to a cell and copy down whatever number's in there, let's say he's gone to cell one and there's a five in, he can run up to cell one, take the five and copy it into his little accumulator and then come back to his abacus. But that's all he can do. He can't remember three numbers or five numbers or hundred numbers every time he has to go to a pigeonhole to do anything somewhat meaningful. Now, there is one other thing that the robot has got in his repertoire. He's got a little label which I'm gonna represent actually with the label here. And this says, this is like a little index. This is like a little thumbnail or a thumbtack that he can apply to one of these pigeonholes to say, hey, um, this is where I am. If I'm in the middle of doing a whole bunch of operations, then this is the point where I'm gonna come back to before. So just with some very, very simple operations, and I'm gonna write down the list of operations. Uh, let me put that somewhere where we can still see it. 
The robot can, he can go to a pigeonhole. I'm gonna call that loading. So it's loading a number from a pigeonhole into the accumulator. So he can load a number and he can load from a pigeonhole. And when I load it from a pigeonhole, I'm gonna put a little at sign to say, this is the uh, pigeonhole number that I'm going to load from. He can also just write down a particular number. If you wanna put like the number seven, not the contents of pigeonhole seven, but just the actual number seven, we can just load seven. And I'm gonna use a little hash there to mean this is the number seven as opposed to the address of seven. And this would be like load at 10 to say load at the address 10. He can also load at wherever the index pointer is pointing at. So I'm just gonna say a special thing that says load at index. And that says wherever that little pink index marker is, go and read the number that's inside that pigeonhole, that particular pigeonhole. All right, and then similarly, we wanna be able to write back to this pigeonhole. We need to make changes to it. So we can say store, and we can either store at a particular address, so store at like pigeonhole seven, or we can store at where the index is. We can also add, subtract, multiply. For the purposes of this little demonstration, I'm just gonna write down one of the things that we're gonna do. And I'm gonna say we can add, and again, you could like add a particular number, so like add seven. And that means add the number seven to whatever's on your piece of paper and replace it with that. We could also add with the contents of one of those pigeonholes. So this would mean, let's do 13. This would mean go to pigeonhole 13, note down the number temporarily, and then add it to the abacus and write that number down. So if you've got 10 in the accumulator and you go to cell 13 and that had number seven in it, you'd add the 10 and the seven and your new accumulator value would be 17. And then we've got a couple of other operations that we need in order to do something slightly interesting. So we can increment the index, that means move it along to the next box in the array of boxes. We can also decrement the index, which obviously means to move it the other way. And then finally, we can jump or go to an earlier place in our program, because what we're gonna do with these uh, instructions that we have available to us is we're going to build a little program and that's like a recipe, and we want to be able to go back to an earlier step to, to do the, a sequence of steps over and over again. So this would be jump to some spot. Okay, so what can we do with this simple steps that a robot can do? We would like to put them together. So I'm going to use this to write out a program to output the Fibonacci sequence of numbers, which is, if you remember, one and one, and then you add the two previous numbers to those numbers, to get the next one. So one plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, and then I'm not gonna test my own mental arithmetic at, under, <laughs> under the gun to, <laughs> to check that, but I, I, th I think it's 13. And as I was explaining that to you, that's kind of the way that the computer would do it too, right? I said, I wrote down one and one, I know the first two Fibonacci numbers are one and one, and then for every subsequent number, I said, go back and add the previous two numbers together and then write that next one out. Now we've got nowhere to write in the robots running around the computer world, but what I can do is I can put them in subsequent pigeonholes in my memory. So that's what we're going to do. So how might we start this out? Uh, well, the first thing I want to do is I want to put the two ones in the first two locations in the pigeonholes. And so how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna say, step one, load the number one into the accumulator. And so our robot, in fact, I can write, here's my little accumulator. I've got a little piece of paper here, so I might as well pretend to be the robot. Um, I'm gonna write the number one here. That's step one, fantastic. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna store, so step two, store that at address zero. I'm gonna say the zeroth pigeonhole Computer people love to start at zero, as I'm sure you're very well aware. Yeah. It's never caused any problems at all, um, starting at zero instead of one. <laughs> we're gonna store that in the zeroth location, and then we're also gonna store it in the oneth location. It is all zeros and ones. Um, I'm gonna get one more piece of paper, we'll come back to that one. Of course, I'm gonna have to raid the place where paper lives in any household, which is the printer drawer. So I'm gonna make a new empty memory array of pigeonholes. And so after having done these first three operations, I would have put one in my accumulator. Oops, I'm holding this the wrong way around. And I would have put it in cells zero and one. So one would go in here and one would go in here. Fantastic. Okay, so far, so we've done the first two numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. Nobody is that excited. Right now, what we would like to do is start keeping track of this, uh, of a process we can repeat over and over and over again as to make the next 
uh, number. What I'd like to do is use the index register, this little purple pink thing, to take a note of where we are in the sequence. So I'm going to start by saying, let's put it at the beginning of the boxes. So the fourth thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, load the index. Oops, I realized I didn't write down that that's something the, the robot can do. But we're going to say, put the index at cell zero. Okay, now we're into a bit that we are going to do over and over and over again. Step five, we're going to load the number that's at the index which obviously we know what it is at this point because we've just put one in there, but to have a sort of general thing we can do over and over again, we, we're, we're gonna do the same step over and over again. So we load out the index, that's gonna read the number one into our accumulator. Well, turns out it was already there. We're gonna increment If you were load, the it blitzes index. out whatever else was there, doesn't it, into the accumulator? That's right. Yeah. So we would have thrown away the one and then we would have loaded back in a new new a one, new, a fresh, fresh shiny, shiny one from our yeah, collection. I know, yeah, oh, I love the smell of a fresh one. Um, and then we're going to increment the index, and incrementing the index moves it along to the next cell. Then we're going to say, well, add to the accumulator, using our abacus, add whatever is at the new place where the index is. Well, again, in this instance, we're going to go to the, we'll run off to the, the cell, it's a one in there, and we're going to replace this one with the sum of those two, which is two. Hooray. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Uh, step eight. We're going to increment the index one more time because now we want to put this result, this new Fibonacci number, we're going to put it in the next cell. So we're going to move the index over to index two, which is currently empty. And then step nine, we're going to store at wherever the index is pointing. So now we'll put the number two over here in our pigeonhole. And I think we can see where this is going. Now, what we need to do is we need to set it up ready for the next step. Right, we need to um, set ourselves up so that we're ready to go round the, the loop again to, to do this over and over again. And so what we need to do is put the index at the beginning of the pair of two numbers that we want to add together. And in order to do that, we need to move it back one. So in step 10, we're going to decrement the index. So now he's pointing at one. And then finally, we're exactly ready to do the next Fibonacci number. So in, in step 11, we're gonna say, go to, or jump, what did I say? I said jump, didn't I? Jump to step uh, five, step five. So I'm gonna put a little draw line under here. Uh, you can sort of see where we are. So then if we were to carry on, which I'll do very quickly, we would uh, load at the index, we'd put one in our accumulator, move the index along one, we get two, add whatever's the, uh, the index now to this to get our three, Move the index forward again to uh, get ourselves into an empty cell. Write the number three in here and move the index back and off we go forever. And so now we have an infinite sequence of Fibonacci numbers uh, and a program that never ends, which is a whole other problem. But that's cool, right? We've just used very, very simple, very, very simple uh, instructions that the robot can do. Um, and we've been able to build a Fibonacci program. So. That's cool and all, but there's one other kind of really nice thing that you can sort of get from this understanding of how a computer might work. First of all, you know, putting numbers in boxes. First of all, it sounds very abstract, which it is. Numbers in boxes are not that exciting. So two things. One, there can be another piece of circuitry or another sort of robot, if you like, that, that makes some of these pigeonholes connected to, in a modern day, the brightness of LEDs or LCD pixels on a screen. And so you could imagine if we had some set of pigeonholes, like from say pigeonhole a million to a pigeonhole 1,500,000, each of those corresponds to a pixel on a, on a monitor. And now suddenly by writing numbers to boxes, we're making pictures happen somewhere. So that's one sort of observation. And back in the day, certainly on the BBC Micro, um, there were ways of getting the TV screen to display so that you could write say the number 65, which just happens to correspond to a capital A in ASCII, and a capital A would appear somewhere on the screen on the BBC Micro. Now, when you're 10 years old, that's an earth shattering moment when you realize that literally changing numbers inside the memory of your computer makes something cool and interesting happen on your screen. So that's awesome. And we can definitely dig into that some other time. But what I would like to do is sort of show you how this little program that we wrote which you know, we've written on paper, how I might be able to teach the computer this program. Because at the moment I've just said there is a program. Maybe this is all the robot can do, which is a very boring robot and certainly doesn't play Elite or Exile or any of the cool games that I used to play. So 
Let's go back to my list of all of the instructions, noting now that we're missing one, which was the load the index. So here is the list of all the things the robot can do. And I'm gonna number these instructions. I'm gonna say this is instruction zero, this is instruction one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So we've got 11, because again, we started at zero, uh, 11 different things that the robot can do. And so I could actually encode the whole program as a sequence of numbers. So let's try doing that. Here is my, my program. Let's make sure I can see them. So I'm gonna sort of draw a new area of screen. I couldn't find green fan field feed, feed paper for the life of you me. Said, during lockdown, I was posting it to people, but it- I know. bet, it's, it's, there are people who will sell it on Etsy for any amount of money. Uh, it's ridiculous, but anyway. We, so our program, I'm going to make it into a sequence of numbers. So load number one is the first step of our program. So this is lo a load of an, an actual number, load hash, which is in our case is instruction number one. So the first number in our sequence that is gonna represent our entire program is one. And then we actually need the number one. So I'm gonna say one is the next number. And the, the robot will know having read a one that that's load whatever the next number is into the accumulator. So one means load and then the one is the one that it's going to load into the accumulator. I'm going to write these on different uh, lines just to kind of keep some track of it. And obviously you can see how this is going once I start doing it. The next instruction is store at zero. Now store at is instruction number three. So we're going to say three zero. And then we want to store at one which is going to be three one and so on. You could imagine taking each of these high level, high level uh, operations that the robot can do and encoding it as a sequence of numbers. Now, this is the machine code that the computer, the CPU, deep down, even today, actually executes. That's all it can do. So you've seen any number of like programs like Python or C or, uh, you know, you're using Excel or whatever to write programs in. Ultimately, the only thing the computer can do, the only thing the CPU at the bottom of it can do is understand a sequence of numbers, just as I've described here. Obviously, a little bit more complicated than just the 10 instructions I've got, but actually not as not that much more complicated because once you've got a few of these things, you can build any program you like. Where are we going to put this machine code, right? This is this is fantastic. This is a way of explaining the, to, to the computer what I want it to do, but can I feed it into the side of the computer? I don't know what to do. Well. If only we had a massive array of empty boxes that I could put a sequence of numbers into. So that's exactly what we're going to do. What we would do is we would take our, let's find a, our original thing here. We just go and find a spare set of boxes. Let's say this is box 1000. And I would write the sequence of numbers in that we've got from assembling, as this is called, the assembly code, this is the human readable form of what we're asking the computer to do, into the machine understandable form of just a sequence of numbers. So in box 1000, we'd have one, 1001, we'd have one, three, zero, three, one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we get to the jump, if you remember we said jump at the end of this program would be go to step five. Well, step five doesn't make any sense to a computer now, but what we can do is we can say which pigeonhole for it to go back to. So by, by the time we get to this, this would be about, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, not gonna bother assembling the whole thing here, otherwise we'd be here forever. Uh, 10,012, let's say is the jump. Jump is instruction number nine. And then in the next box, we'd have to put what number box we need to go to. And let's say it was, you know, 1006, something like this. So this would jump to 1006. And we're gonna ignore the fact that in these types of computers, you can't put the number 1006 in a pigeonhole. Um, that's for another day. But this was a, a watershed moment for me as a kid, as I realized that everything could be expressed very simply. And from those very simple things, you can build anything. And of course, as a kid, all you're interested in is building video games. And moreover, just the right sequence of numbers is actually how the computer works. And um, once you've kind of got your head around that, you kind of understand a lot of things. Like for example, if we were to actually run our Fibonacci program now, after the thousandth Fibonacci number, it would start overwriting box 1000, which is unfortunately the program we're actually running. And I think we could see what would happen with that. Eventually the robot would write over its own program and 
something untoward would happen. We haven't said what would happen if the robot read, you know, number 11 or 14. You know, in modern processes, that would be a crash and you would see something horrific happen and hopefully your operating system would say, you know, oh, there's been a, a fault of sorts. <laughs> this, the screen would certainly go a different colour on my computer, yes. That's right, yeah, yeah. So definitely whenever things have crashed and you see all this kind of nonsense um, stuff appearing all over the top of the screen. That's because the, the the processor, the robot's gone awry and has written over the pigeonholes that actually correspond to the picture you're looking at, which is amazing. Because we can shoot rays out and we can do things. What's important here is that when you shoot the rays out here, executed from this, and then we will see that we are generating a thousand random numbers. Here we were very lucky. There is no failure.